Stadiums are the landmarks on the landscape of professional football. They are graveyards for some teams. Fortresses for others. They appear forbidding and fraught with peril for teams on the road through a season. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, that it is better to travel in hope than to arrive. Teams arrive in different fashion. Losers arrive storm-tossed. Winners arrive star-kissed. For the best teams, arrival marks the beginning rather than the end, for they realize that there is only one thing to be in the NFL, and that is champion of it. Most teams claim to number one lasts only a game, for others, possibly a season. However, the greatest teams survive the test of time and possess special qualities. One embodied the essence of the word team. Another displayed true grit that made them America's team. One reached out and touched perfection. Another endured for all reasons and all seasons. As professional football evolves into the 1980s, the elements that make the game sparkle today can be traced to Los Angeles, California, over 30 years ago, where the modern pro offense was born. Offensively, the Los Angeles Rams were decades ahead of their time, and in 1950, were the most explosive team in the history of the sport. With quarterbacks Bob Waterfield and Norm Van Brocklin throwing to a bounty of all pro receivers, the Rams presented a carnival of big plays, a merry-go-round offense with a simple philosophy. To hell with how many points the opposition scores, we'll just score more. In one season, the Rams scored 466 points, 39 a game a pinnacle unmatched by any NFL team before or since. Ironically, the Rams did not win the league title in 1950. That distinction belonged to a group of upstarts, the Cleveland Browns, who joined the NFL and won the championship in their first year of play. Their creator, Paul Brown, was a master innovator. The fabric of pro football was altered by this man and his team. From sending in plays from the sideline to the invention of the face mask, it was Brown's intention that everything his team did would be ahead of its time. And that meant being the best. Quarterback Otto Graham and a thundering fullback named Marion Motley fueled a string of ten consecutive division or league titles. The Browns dominated much of the 1950s, then gave way to a team that had been losing as much as the Browns had won. A small town in Wisconsin was turned into the capital of football excellence by the Green Bay Packers. While there was talk of new formations, momentum and mystique, the Packers went back to basics and proved the game was still one of blocking and tackling. 
They were a mix of old men reborn and golden boys with promise. Blended by Vince Lombardi, who demanded total dedication from his team and got it. The Packer offense was not explosive. Rather, it was a power game, not built on deception, but on precise, devastating execution of a handful of plays. From the simple screen pass to the sweep to the trap play, their charge was as unified as Patton's third army. The Packers preferred the feel of a power sweep to the arc of a long pass, but Green Bay pass plays were carried through with the same lean and lethal style. Lombardi emphasized simplicity on defense as well. It was a basic one-on-one, -on -one, me against you approach. There were old-fashioned virtues stamped all over Packer teams. Hard work, second effort, loyalty, and love. In seven years, those virtues carried the Packers to five NFL championships and wins in the first two Super Bowls. The Packer experience was unique, extolled by Jerry Kramer, number 64. Be all you can be. We were everything we could possibly be. We, we gave everything we had. We didn't save anything. There weren't any tomorrows for us. It was a great personal pride, a great emotional feeling. I, you never are sure whether winning breeds that warmth or that warmth breeds winning, but you never have one without the other. The roots of the Packer psyche were exposed to the limit in the 1967 championship game. In a survival test that called for guts and desire, the Packers marched a final 67 yards to Doomsday's doorstep. Bart Starr coming over to check with Coach Vince Lombardi. 20 seconds remaining in this football game. The Packers inches away from something that has never before happened in pro football history. A third straight NFL championship. The Packers come out of the huddle. As the twilight deepened and the cold intensified, the Packers were down to one final play. Star begins the count. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback sneak and he's into the touchdown and the Packers are out in front. And the Green Bay Packers are going to be NFL champions for the third straight year. Had the Packers won the game easily, they would have been remembered as the team of the 60s. But winning the way they did, they became a team for the ages. In an era where teams ascend and plummet like comets, the Oakland Raiders have remained a fixed star. 17 straight winning seasons, nine division titles, two Super Bowl championships. From top to bottom, managing general partner Al Davis designed the blueprint for the organization. While Davis patterned Raider uniforms after the Army football team, the Black Knights of the Hudson, he shaped their image after Blackbeard the Pirate. Their players were cut from a different cloth, renegades with faces only a mother could love. The Raiders cultivated, then reveled in their ominous image. We were the black colors, the skull and the crossbones, and you know, we didn't represent everything that was good. So we probably led the league in boos, you know, B-O-O, -O, boo. Uh, because everywhere we'd go, you know, we'd go on the road and boo. But it was a means of acceptance. I mean, the worst thing for your football team to go out on the field would be to complete silence. It's like there's no one there. And, and we kind of 
did encourage that, and the players kind of like, you know, that, you know, everyone's against us, you know, we have to band together. Nowhere was this thinking more evident or more persuasive than on defense, where the motto was, might makes right. The mauling, brawling, rated defense has traditionally been one of the most intimidating, most penalized, and most effective units in the game. When the Raiders sense fear, anxiety, or weakness, they go for the throat. Beneath this unwavering, ferocious image was a compelling, flexible philosophy. This is a goal-oriented organization, and our goal is to win, to be on top, to maintain our level of excellence, so that everything we do has singleness of purpose. If it's going to interfere with our winning, we're going to make a change, so that we don't, we're not slaves to routine. Al Davis has a, a saying that I think a lot of us has, have picked up. We don't say never we don't say always. To us, it's much more important to be right at the moment than it is to be consistent. Al Davis dresses in the past, but thinks in the future. He is called the genius, and his signature is written on every offensive play. In the deeply rutted path of conventional football, he paved some artfully new directions. Davis disdained possession football for an all-out assault on the end zone. Every play was designed to reach the scoreboard. The idea was to keep the defense off balance by always pushing forward, hurrying the ball downfield. The Raiders became the second highest scoring team over the last 20 years by developing an offense that made the long pass as reliable a weapon as the off-tackle play. Like a New York Yankee emblazoned in pinstripes, the wearer of silver and black was a special person. In their search for these special players, the Raiders operated as lone wolves, ignoring talent pools and scouting combines. Men like Fred Beletnikoff, number 25, fit hand in glove with their unique system. When we bring people in here, we're looking for people who will fit the philosophy of football that we believe in. For instance, when LaMonica was here, he was known as the Mad Bomber. We didn't throw long because we had LaMonica. We got LaMonica because we wanted to throw long. While most teams employed the bomb only as a desperate measure, the Raiders used it as a matter of routine. They were the first team to extensively and effectively utilize setbacks to complement receivers in long distance patterns. Oakland knew well that linebackers were ill-equipped to cover running backs in the open field. The position of tight end, once the province of lumbering linemen, was streamlined by the Raiders into one of grace and speed. Oakland also tinkered with old notions about offensive linemen and came up with a lineup of giants. 
Many chuckled when they transformed the huge college All-American tackle named Gene Upshaw into a guard. As usual, the last laugh came from the Raiders. The Raider running game effectively counterpointed their ambitious passing philosophy. Here a succession of rough and tumble backs, beginning with number 44, Marv Hubbard, proved not to be trifled with. No fancy feints and jabs here, just heavy weight right hands under the heart. The Raiders have been the winningest team over the past 20 years. Testament that their body of football philosophy remains effectively alive. The Raiders were a team of character and characters, and despite their reputation as an ill wind, there were some breezy, free spirits. Even Jaunty John Matten, who won 100 games in 10 years, used some bizarre methods. Now, I used to say something before a game, every game before we'd go out, and, I, and sometimes even at halftime before we'd go out, and I had no idea what it meant, but I heard it someplace, and it sounded like a pretty good idea. The last thing I'd say was, don't worry about the horse being blind, just load the wagon. Then let's go. I have no idea what it meant, but you know, some guys kind of got excited when I said it. Oakland trails 20 to 14. Ten seconds left. The crowd takes up a chant of defense. Robisky and Banizak on the back. Slot right. Branch inside. Bradshaw, stay for the back. Here comes the rush, he sidesteps, can he throw? He can't! The ball will flip forward as well as a wild scramble, two seconds on the clock. Casper grabbing the ball, it is all a fumble, Casper has recovered in the end zone, the Oakland Raiders have scored on the most seamy, unbelievable, absolutely impossible dream of a play. The play was aptly called the Holy Roller, another chapter in Raider folklore. They were the unquestioned kings of the improbable, impossible victory. Fantastic finishes and storybook endings lent almost a mythic quality to the team. It's not real. 52,000 people minus a few lonely Raider fans are stunned. A man would be a fool to ever try and write a drama and make you believe it. This one will be relived forever. That's one thing that we'd always taken great pride in, that when we were behind and we had to move the ball and we had to get something done, that we'd do it. When you get in a pressure situation, there's no one that you'd rather have involved in that play than Kenny Stabler. He has the uncanny knack of putting a ball uh, between people and between hands and, and just being able to slip things in there from all different angles, and that's exactly what he did. Kenny the Snake Stabler possessed a Midas touch, and the Oakland Raiders found a pot of gold under his rainbow. The greatness of Stabler was not measured by statistics, though they were impressive. It was gauged by his heroics in the clutch. Nowhere was this trait more evident than on December 21st, 1974, when a playoff victory appeared certain for Don Shula's Dolphins. There he is, fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. He's caught, he throws. It is.
it was... Even though it was called the greatest game ever played, it was not until three years later that the Raiders were considered a great team. From the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, California, it is Super Bowl XI. This is Bill King with a welcome. Every there are no substitutes for a world championship. The only thing the Raiders had never won. Here in the canyon at Arroyo Seco. This was their albatross, the blot on their spotless record. But even this flew away and was erased dramatically in Super Bowl XI against the Minnesota Vikings. The Raiders closing in on the Super Bowl championship. Francis back to pass, throw the sideline, or picked off! It's going to be a touchdown! Willie Brown! 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20... Old man Willie! He's going all the way! Victory elevated both the Oakland Raiders and John Madden to pro football's most exalted station. Three years later, another world championship with a new coach and new stars confirmed the Oakland Raiders as one of the best teams ever. Burning bright beneath the North Texas sky, in the heart of the Lone Star State, is a galaxy of extraordinary football players. They are the Dallas Cowboys, a freewheeling, all-American, star-kissed team. Motivated and disciplined by the genius of a coach named Landon. The Cowboys are pro football's glamour team. Dynamic, progressive, and spectacular. Consistency is a Cowboy trademark. Underscored by 15 straight winning seasons, 11 division titles, and two world championships. Their success is forged by a belief in acquiring outstanding natural athletes, then molding them in the cowboy system. Athletes like Bullet Bob Hayes, number 22, who went from Olympic champion sprinter to all pro receiver. The Cowboys seldom allow time for rebuilding, since winning waits for no such luxury. Time and time again, the Cowboys retool on the move, replacing one part of their smoothly running machine with another. In 1972, the Cowboys won their first Super Bowl. Six years later, pro football's premier team won their second in glorious style. Roger goes deep across the middle, way downfield, and good shots and caught! Touchdown! A sensational diving catch by Butch Johnson, the Cowboy! A world championship is the ultimate achievement in any sport. But Coach Tom Landry has learned more along the way to the Super Bowl than by winning. Well, I don't think I would enjoy my profession if I knew I was always a winner. I think it's really the chase that's important. It's the challenge uh, that you're after, much more than the winning. The chase begins with defense. In a royal succession of leaders, from Bob Lilly to Randy White, 
cowboy intensity is handed down from one generation to the next. Always the mix of budding stars and all pros. They perfected the innovative flex defense that boiled in a melting pot called Doomsday. In like manner, the cowboy offense is intricately designed. It looks like confusion to anybody who doesn't know much about the game because it looks like it's just 11 men attacking each other at one time. But as you learn the game, it becomes very scientific, especially in professional football, and becomes very intriguing and exciting. The cowboys approach the end zone like a team attending a buffet supper, sampling a wide range of delights before finishing the meal. Other cowboy innovations include reviving the shotgun offense, not used in 15 years. Sometimes you have to reach back to stay a step ahead. What makes the Cowboys so appealing is what separates the good teams from the great ones. The ability to come from behind to win. Shotgun formation, Starbox looking into the face of a four-man rush, throwing, caught, springs. Go. Touchdown. Touchdown, Rod Springs. Given a win or else situation in the closing moments, no team was ever better. You gotta love them. I mean, you gotta love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. They can pull it out. 42 seconds left in the game. Redskins lead by six. This is a killer. Second down and eight. From the eight yard line. No shotgun this time. Staubach throwing in the end zone. Cody Hill! The Cowboys' comeback charisma was embodied in Roger Starbuck. When he bid his grand farewell to the game, there were doubts that his magic could be replaced. But Danny White, who had watched Starbuck miracles from the sidelines for six years, had that same penchant for saving lost causes with last second heroics. Comes the blitz again, Danny back to throw, into the end zone! From Bob Hayes to Drew Pearson, from Bob Lilly to Randy White, and from Roger Starbuck to Danny White, another cowboy transition was complete. It's not so much that the cowboys win football games, it's the manner in which they win that makes them one of the best ever. In 1972, the Miami Dolphins became the first and only team in NFL history to go through an entire season unbeaten. The strength of Don Shula's team was in its balance rather than its brilliance, though there were performers of superstar quality on the roster. Basically, Miami ran a conservative, straight-ahead offense that featured number 39 fullback Larry Zonka. It was grinding, steady, mistake-proof football. On defense as well, Miami allowed its opponents no margin for error. Before the coming of Don Shula, the Dolphins' biggest name was Flipper, who frolicked in a tank in the east end zone of the half-empty Orange Bowl. The fans who were there enjoyed the sun more than the outcome of Dolphin games. 
But Shula soon changed sunbathers into flag wavers. As Miami earned instant success under his command. In 1970, Shula's first season as coach, a team that had won only three games the year before, won 10 and made the playoffs. In his second season, Miami won 12 and reached the Super Bowl. In 1972, Shula's third year, the Dolphins were literally unstoppable winning 17 straight, including Super Bowl VII. Brainy Bob Greasy was the Dolphins' leader on the field. He quarterbacked an offense that broke a 36-year-old record to become the greatest running team in NFL history. Behind an offensive line that was simply awesome, Miami became the first to have 2,000-yard runners on the same squad. The inside man was Zonka, the prototype of the bruising fullback. He was perfectly complemented by the outside moves and speed of number 22, Mercury Mark. An irony of this perfect season was that Bob Greasy was lost in the fifth game with a broken leg. But ageless veteran Earl Morrow replaced him, and in one of the great relief roles in sports history, the offense never missed a beat. Miami's famous no-name defense also came to the rescue, performing brilliantly and often putting points on the scoreboard themselves. In Super Bowl VII, only the Washington Redskins stood between Miami and football immortality. The Dolphins defeated the Redskins and ended the year with 17 wins and no defeats. For one season, no team was ever better than Don Shula's 1972 Miami Dolphins. For 40 years, no team was ever as bad as the Pittsburgh Steelers. Their offense looked as if it were directed by the Marx Brothers. And on defense, they went down like paper soldiers in the wind. But the Steelers' sad story became ancient history when owner Art Rooney hired Chuck Knoll as head coach. Knoll came from a winning background with Cleveland and recalled that the Browns used to make fun of the Steelers. Upon accepting Rooney's offer, Knoll vowed no one will laugh at this team ever again. If you knew the Steelers before, before he got here, uh, we had never won anything and... Uh, I think we were uh, pretty much of a, you know, a joke. When Coach Noel got here, it's sort of like uh, Moses leading the people across the Red Sea. In just four years, Noel rebuilt the team, and in 1972, the Steelers made the playoffs for the first time. 
For connoisseurs of destiny, it was a day to remember. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. That's cut out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. Franco Harris's immaculate reception marked the beginning of Pittsburgh's remarkable rise to power. In the following years, they would win more games in more different ways than anyone ever thought possible. Due to superb college drafting, no team ever challenged its opponents with as many great athletes. Thirteen Steelers have been named All-Pro. Here comes Terry Bradshaw now. Where's it? Terry, Terry, Terry. Good luck today, man. Hey, Watch yourself. See you later. The NFL's number one pick in 1970, Terry Bradshaw, experienced an erratic rookie season. But Noel never gave up on the talented youngster. This was paramount, for Pittsburgh had a history of impatience with young players. The most glaring example came in 1956, when a free agent named John Unitas was given a quick look and found wanted. Earl Morrill, who was traded by Pittsburgh in 1958, went on to lead Miami to the Super Bowl. Len Dawson, the Steelers' top draft pick in 57, was gone by 59. And Jack Kemp, who won championships for Buffalo, was cut in the mid-50s. But Bradshaw was allowed to mature and he gave Pittsburgh stability at quarterback for the first time. He also had one of the most powerful throwing arms ever seen, and the Bradshaw Bullet became legend in Pittsburgh. While Bradshaw was brilliant, the power gear of Pittsburgh's attack was the ground game. That meant number 32, Franco Harris, Pittsburgh's perennial thousand-yard rusher and the third leading runner of all time. Bradshaw's arm and Harris's flying feet were just two elements in the plentiful package of Pittsburgh talent. Another was the most awesome defense in the entire NFL. Pittsburgh's steel curtain simply manhandled opponents with sheer physical strength. They played swarming, smothering defense, punctuated with a kind of vicious individual tackling that caused the enemy to forget the football. No defense in football could equal Pittsburgh's invincible steel curtain. In the mid-70s, Pittsburgh won with defense and Franco Harris. In the late 70s, their tactics changed. Everybody knows we run Franco, we run Franco, and everybody's trying to stop Franco. And so we just said, fine, you stop Franco, we'll throw the football. Terry 
Ray Bradshaw's targets were Lynn Swan and John Stallworth, number 82, a Barnum and Bailey act in cleats, the most dangerous pair of pass catchers in the league. No story about the Steelers would be complete without Pittsburgh's fanatical following. Steeler country included such characters as Hollywood Bats, Mean Joe, Mad Dog, and Arrowhead Earth. It was a collection as colorful as Steelers fans themselves, and no one appreciated this close-knit camaraderie more than the Pittsburgh players. Pittsburgh is a close community. It's tight. Um, they, they do get involved with, with this football team. And as I say, they adopted this football team, and we, all, we belong to them. That's my Pittsburgh Steeler right there. They're really tremendous fans, and they, they will not be outdone by any other National Football League city. You want to see the killer for Cleveland today? Yeah. Right here. Come. We got the Italian That's whammy. That's the big red pepper. Italian that whammy. That we put it on. That means Cleveland he can't he do he nothing. He NFL field. Never seen the red pepper. That's right. Give him the red pepper. And, and I tell you, wait a minute. Here's, here's the kicker. Come. This you got to see. I know you ain't never seen this in your life. Here's the man right here inside. There it is. Little Italian hunchback. <laughs> yeah. That's a killer. But the real killer was the terrible tower. It posed an insurmountable obstacle for Pittsburgh's opponents. The Steelers have the terrible tower going for them. Yep, this year we've had a revival of the terrible tower. It imputes great strength to the Steelers and if need be, poses mysterious difficulties for the enemy. You'll see thousands upon thousands of terrible towels waving out in those stands today. The terrible towel is poised to strike, and so are the Steelers. Bradshaw giving the ball to Blyer. Blyer reverses it to Swan. He gives it back to Bradshaw. Bradshaw fired for Cunningham. A Pittsburgh touchdown. How about that? A Pittsburgh touchdown to win the ball. Of all the cheers during the Steeler dynasty, the most welcome was heard in 1974. Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl. We got a feeling. Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl. We got a feeling. Art Rooney's team won the Super Bowl in 1974 and again in 1975 against the Dallas Cowboys. Two years later, they defeated Dallas again for Super Bowl win number three. Then in 1980, they won over the Los Angeles Rams in Super Bowl XIV. The Pittsburgh Steelers made up for 40 years of defeat with a decade of victory. A decade unequaled for sustained excellence. Eight straight playoff appearances, four Super Bowl championships. The Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1970s, the best team ever. <laughs>